Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I am your host, DK, and with me, as always, is Luxurious Lou. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do like my fancy shoes. DK on the mixer, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today we have a very special guest. Um, long time mentor. We've talked a lot about you on the show and your influence over uh, my mixes, my work, my my business ethics, even family time. The amazing, illustrious Leslie Brathway. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Finally, man. Thanks can I say me. finally? I know. I guess you <laughs> can. Yeah, we've been trying to put this together for like three weeks, four weeks. Like every week, I just keep having to cancel. I'm like, no, I can't come right now because you know, I've been I've been mixing a couple projects that like it's like Monday is actually crazy day. So you know, um, been mixing this Jack Harlow album it comes out Friday. So excited about that. Nice, nice. Yeah, comes out Friday, May sixth. Uh, come home, the kids miss you. Is the name of the album. So. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be, it's a good album. I really, really I like it. I feel good about it. Uh TZO mixed the first two singles mm-hmm. and then uh I mixed the rest of the album. Dope. That's so awesome. shout out to TZO. My That's guy. Awesome. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. Yeah, actually, but TZO's yeah. been on the show now as well, and we're also good oh, nice. friends with him and we uh we're excited to see I loved your post about Celebrating other engineers. Mm-hmm. I thought that Facts. was. Oh, cool. and by the way, congrats to TZO on his number one yep. for first class. That was huge. So yeah, now nah, it's all for me. It, that's what it's about. For me, it's, it's a brotherhood of of engineers. We all respect each other. You can technically, from the outside, look at this as we're competition, but I don't look at it that way. Mm-hmm. I've always looked at it like uh, we all have different gifts. We all have different timing. Um, what is for Tizio is for Tizio. What's for me is for me. What's for you is for you. I don't ever look at it as competing or competitive. Yeah. Um, so I I was super happy when it went number one and super happy to congratulate Tizio. And, you know, I, I know he's doing his thing. He's, you know, a little younger in the game than I am, but it's always good when you can encourage your fellow engineers and, you know, just enjoy everybody's work. Like, I just... Like, even on the Pusha album, I'm, like, loving Manny's mixes. You know, it's, it's just about cheering on each other and, and acknowledging that we all do good work. So. Yeah. Honestly speaking, like, that's actually... I'm really glad to hear you say that because, like, uh, I've been asked by, like, some of the people that were lucky enough to be able to mentor with, through our program, right? But um, one of the questions that I get is, like, yo, how do you, like, maintain professionalism when you know that you're supposed to be mixing one thing and then they hire another mix engineer or this and that? Or, like, how do you maintain relationships without getting overly competitive? I'm like, well, honestly speaking, I look at it as motivation uh, type of co- competitiveness like you might hear them work on a mix and you might be like you know what their top end's better than mine i'm not looking at it as like a hater it's like Absolutely. yo how do i get it like that because that is amazing Absolutely. like they I killed always, it and that's and that's the thing um lou is i always look at it as an opportunity to learn so for yeah. instance and it's happened to all of us in different I've, I've been on both ends of it, even now in my career, where I was just mixing a record with, with Pharrell not too long ago. It was a, um, I believe it was a Monica record. And then for some reason, he was like, man, I want to try Fabian. And then Fabian mixed it. And then I called Fabian because I had to send him all the files. And one thing I, I can always say, no, no engineer has ever been able to say about me is I will never be bitter about having to turn over files or send files to another engineer to mix yeah. it if that's what the producer wants or the artist wants or the label wants. And then Fabian and I are friends. So it's like I called him up. I was like, bro, I got all the stems you need. I got the full session, however you want to mix it. You know, let me know what you do on the top end. Let me know what you do that helps Pharrell get over that hump. And we were talking about compression and da da da. So mm. like you, I look at it like a learning opportunity. And you also have to realize, too, in those situations, a lot of times, it's not just an indictment on your talent. And I think we as human beings tend to take it personal. Uh, one of my favorite books of all time is a book called The Four Agreements. And one of the agreements you make with yourself is you don't take things personal. And it, you apply it to this situation. Um, we tend to, as human beings, take it so personal that 
you know, somebody else is mixing something. What does that mean about me? Sometimes it's not an indictment on your talent. And even in this situation I just described, it wasn't that Fabian was the better mixer. Fabian was in Miami and Pharrell was in Miami. And I could tell he just wanted to be there. And yeah. I think that was the thing that pushed him more towards Fabian. And I still mix Pharrell records is that Pharrell had one on Jack Harlow. So it's not like if somebody chooses to go another direction, that means, oh my, like even with the Jack Harlow stuff where Jack called me up when he was doing the first thing and said, hey man, no, we had a lot of success first album, da, da, da. I just want to try around a couple of this. I think they went to Jason Joshua and they ended up on Tizio for the first single and then they went back to Tizio for first glass. But I didn't take that as a slight or a problem. I just took it as, oh, okay, cool. You want to see what other things are out there and what other sounds. And then eventually he was like, but you know what? I missed your sound. I want to come back to you for the rest of the album, da, da, da. It's all love and it's all good and I never take it personal. And it's, it's like you said, it's an opportunity to learn sometimes. Um, I love getting sessions from other engineers too. Like, it's, it's, it's the way I learn about new plugins all the time. Like, whenever <laughs> I open a session, like, if DK, if you send me a session, the first thing I'm doing, this is, this is the first practice I do is I open the session and then I look for all the grayed out plugins that I don't have and I go buy them. And what I do, what that is is an opportunity for me to learn how to use these plugins that I don't normally use. Yeah. So I, I love the interaction of mixing things that other people may have tried to mix or vice versa. It's it's all love to me, man. I, I never get bent out of shape about any of it. That's amazing. Actually, yeah. talking about the four agreements, that is a book that I recently read, and I was going through the old mix with the masters notebook from our time together. And on, like, page two, you specifically talked about the four agreements. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, I remember that. And the cool thing, specifically, to go a little bit deeper into that with not taking things personally, it was interesting to me that the book would say, of course, negative things. If someone calls me ugly, that like, not a personal thing, but also positive things. If -hmm. someone says that you're the best in the world, don't, don't let that get to your head. Like, just move on. Accept it. Absolutely. Which is really interesting. Um, but I love that we talk about this sort of stuff. This is one of the big things that I respect about you is I feel like you are very good with, with at least understanding like philosophy, ethics, and kind of more the emotional aspect of the business, which is so important and so needed, um, just as much as the actual craft. And I, and I take a lot of influence from that. And, um, so today we have, we are live on Twitch right now. We're streaming. This will be on YouTube as well for anybody that's, and we've been having a lot of questions come in for you. Um, but before okay. we get into the questions and talk a little bit further about you, um, I, I would love to reintroduce you to the audience again and talk about many things. So Leslie is a mix engineer from Atlanta, Georgia, has du- can I say a couple dozen Grammys now and multiple, multiple, multiple? It's almost a couple dozen, a little bit less than a... <laughs> yeah, it's not a couple dozen. It's a dozen plus. There you go, dozen okay. plus. A dozen plus. Dozen plus. And yeah. has obviously done so well and very renowned in the... Especially, you were one of the, can I say, most influential and founding mixers of the Atlanta trap scene. And... yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's 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 accurate. And very much <laughs> a big a big influencer with the whole uh, auto tune sound as well within hip hop world, which is crazy to say. I mean, you've worked on Michael Jackson records. You've worked with with old 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 cats and new school cats as well. Lozy Vert's records, uh, Jack Harlow, you said Pharrell, uh, Beyonce, and a bunch of other. This is it's, it's mm-hmm. such an, a very incredible track record. Um, and something that can so easily bloat an ego, <laughs> but somehow, somehow you're still the coolest dude ever. Uh, I'm just really excited that you're able to be on the show and people can kind of get a taste of exactly what, what I think that you're a prime example of someone that deserves all the success that you've ever had. And, and speaking on something you just said, uh, the reason for that, the reason why I think my ego does not get inflated. Um, by all the accolades and everything else is because I understand very clearly that I'm a small part of bigger things. Mm. And I've always said that I would rather be a small part of something great than a large part of something good. And I think a lot of times that's what happens with egos, with artists, with engineers, with producers where they want all the credit. And I'm very much in tune with and aware 
that I have a very small part in a big thing. So when an album gets a Grammy or, you know, goes platinum or multi-platinum or 10 million sales or whatever, you know, a WAP or Jack Harlow, it's a lot of different pieces to that puzzle. It's the, the recording engineer, the producer, the artist, the label, me, Colin Leonard, the guy who masters it, the person who promotes it. You know, it's and just to a, a, a huge extent, the consumer is a part of that too, because without them, the record wouldn't be popular. So, it's all of these factors that make something great, and I, I'm very much in tune with and aware that I'm a small part of that. So. That's that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was blessed very much. I talked about it on one of the first few episodes of the podcast, which has now been going for. Like two and a half, almost three years, which is crazy. I started the podcast right after our Mix with the Master master seminar in France with you. Um, Mm -hmm. So I talked a lot about my experiences there. So it's great to officially have you on. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. We'll get right into the questions if that's okay. Absolutely. We had such a fun time in France, too. (laughs) That that was an epic, epic trip. Like, we had a really good time. I had the opportunity to do it again with a new bunch this this uh, past December. And I think I'm going in the summertime again. They just asked me if I would do summer. Um, but we, that was epic. That was that was an epic trip. It was so really. fun. How was it for the first time compared to the second time? I, I assume it was a little bit different, but... Yeah, the second time was different because I will tell you there were pros and cons. The first time, what I really loved about with, with you guys... You know, there was it was pre-COVID, so there was we were out every night, and we were going to restaurants, and we had different bonding um, experiences, and we were like walking back from town in the middle of the night, and you know, we just had these great bonding moments. Um, and and the thing about the second group is we bonded as well. We had bonding moments, but they were different bonding moments where because we stayed at La Fabrique the whole time. We hardly ever went downtown. And when we did, it was like a couple of people go in spurts, but we never went downtown as a group because no restaurant would seat the whole group. You know, it was just too many of us. So we never traveled as a group or that kind of thing. So, but the bonding was different. So we would sit around dinner time at La Fabrique and we would talk till five in the morning at the dinner table. We would have dinner at like nine and before you know, we look up and it's like five in the morning. We're all just sitting there talking at the table. And the other thing that was very unique about this experience that I wish you guys had gotten to experience was my wife was with me on the second trip. Hmm. So she kind of was a whole part of the group. And we even did a thing on the last day where she did a Q&A. So she was answering questions about like how it is to deal with an engineer or, you know, work-life balance and all that kind of stuff. So that was very informative for a lot of people came up to me and was like, yo, that was probably one of the highlights of the trip is getting to ask Doris a whole lot of questions and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I, I think both both trips were amazing. They just had their unique qualities. And I think you guys being the first group that I did it with, that will always be a special group and a special trip. And it's like, that feeling of going to La Fabrique for the first time with you guys. And like, that's something that won't be duplicated. Like, Of course, of course. Yeah. And man, I'm glad that my buddy Mitch was able to be there. You met Jenny as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. It's a good group of people out <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, that, was, so that was fun when I got to know everybody and they were like, oh, you know DK, that's my guy. And I was like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so... <laughs> It yeah, was, it was so time. awesome. That is so great that they had such a good time. All right, so we, we're going to go straight into the question, and I'm assuming that we'll sort of unpack more about you and more about your philosophies and mentality towards all this stuff. We're just going to go right in. So this is from Pixel Pixel. Um, how do you deal with a client that expects you to match poorly mixed demos? So the demo oh. demo is not good. How, how do you kind of get over that yeah um, a, lot, a lot of times that's the goal is or, or that's the thing is they've been listening to a, a certain thing they fell in love with the song through that certain mix and a lot of times the mixes aren't that good sometimes the demos the roughs we call them the rough mixes they're terrible but what you have to do is figure out what about that rough is the sauce so for instance i can have a terrible rough mix and i know that okay the hi-hats are standing out the hi-hats are the thing that they really love or or that's really driving the rough mix. The rough mix can sound awful. 
But if the hi-hats are driving in and they're super loud, even painfully loud, I know that in my mix, I got to at least be aware of the fact that the hi-hat needs to be loud. That's the thing is, if I can understand that the hi-hat needs to be loud, as, as almost as annoyingly loud as it was in the rough, it's trying to keep the essence of the mix without delivering a terrible mix. So it's, it's figuring out what are those things that they fell in love with. Um, and sometimes it's just the rawness that they like. Like you, a lot of um, Cardi B records, she just likes the rawness of how she sounds when she just came out of the booth. So I try to keep that with her, with her voice, just up in your face, raw. Um, so it's, it's just about figuring out what that thing is that they love and then catering to that. Sorry, I don't, just my headphones. I can't hear myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's about catering to that thing they love and figuring out what is the thing they fell in love with with their rough mix. It, it, sometimes it's not a mix thing, it's a feel thing. And you'll hear me probably say that word a whole lot throughout this podcast. It's I, I remember all sure, about feel. I remember you mentioning that specifically about hi-hats or, or trying to find specific elements. And, yeah, get that feel right or something similar. I find that often, mm-hmm. too, the case yeah. when I get rough mixes that it's not necessarily the tonal balance or could be or couldn't be, but it's how do you communicate that with your clients to figure out, is there any communication that takes place to figure out what it is exactly that they're looking for? Or is it just instant? Yeah. And, and, and again, here comes the word feel. It's, it's always about um, trying to understand how things are making them feel. And then it's my job to figure out what to do. And I, I can give you a story that's a perfect example of that. And I think I told the story in France. Um, so when I first met Cardi B, very first day I met her, they brought her to the studio and we were going to mix her album. You know, we had a week and a half. They, they had just found out she was pregnant. They were rushing. So they brought her to the studio in Atlanta to introduce her to me. And then we were all going down to Miami. When she came that first day, she had just had a mix done for something else that she was working on. And the engineer was from Canada, the mix engineer. And the same day she met me, she was like, hey, I wonder if you could take a listen to something. Something's bothering me about this mix. And I don't know how to communicate to the engineer what I, I need. So the first thing I asked her is I said, well, how, what, what's the problem? What, how is it making you feel? And she used a very specific word. She said, it just makes me dizzy. Mm. And I said, oh, OK. So then I listened to the mix and right away I knew exactly how to fix the mix. There was this sound in the mix. It was the main sound and it was panning really fast. And it was one of the louder main sounds. So I called the engineer and I said, hey, send her back a mix. And all you got to do is take off the auto pan. Don't do anything else to the mix. Don't change anything else. And he was like, yeah, but she says it's all wrong. And I feel like I'm fucking it up. And Oh, sorry. Can I curse? <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah fine, you're, you're fine. fine. You're fine. Bleep, bleep me out. I feel like I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he was like, yeah, I feel like I'm messing it up. And da, da, da. I was like, bro, just take the auto pan off. Trust me. He took the auto pan off, sent the mix back. And she was like, oh, my God, it's perfect. What did you do? And I was like, I just took off the, the, the sound was panning. She didn't know how to use the technical term panning. She was only able to tell me how it made her feel. It made her feel dizzy. So I had to now connect with the feeling and figure out what in this song could possibly make her dizzy. And it, the obvious thing was the very loud sound that was panning like this. So it's it's that, to me, that's the essence of the job of the engineers to figure out how a thing is making an artist feel or how they want to feel about something. And then we go do what we do. Translating the emotional into technical. I feel like yes. that's a big part of what I've talked to you before about my relationship with uh, Keisha Cole where she, she's been in the game for a long time. You know, she knows what she likes, what she doesn't like, but she's not necessarily educated in the, in the technical side of things. So, like, uh, when people are in the room with people, I've had that same issue before. Well, you know, I just don't like the sound. What do you not like about it? You know, I'm not asking her for technical things. I'm always waiting for her to just say, I don't know, I just feel dark. I feel feels blue. big. It I feels feel, too blue. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, I know her well enough to understand what she's after. So like sometimes I'll get calls from producers like, hey, you know, we were talking about this for her show. She's telling me this, like, what does she mean? I'm like, ah, I, I let me hear it. And I could probably tell you what it is, but it becomes a communication difference. And I feel like, like Leslie said, like a big selling point for Cardi and him probably was exactly that. The fact that he just understood what she wanted, even though she couldn't really communicate it. 
So, Leslie, I think this is a, follow, a good follow-up question with that is, how often do you get the time to actually sit down with your clients and get to know them? or Because yeah, I like, feel like that, this is a lot of like instinct with you, where like yeah. you just kind of understand instinctually what's going on. Or, or do you get to spend a lot of time with these clients and kind of understand what they like? Well, I think earlier in my career when I was a recording engineer, I spent... Sorry for the dog barking. I hope it's not missing. It's okay. No it's not a husky so, going... Hur. Hur. <laughs> yeah, so it's a it's a little cockapoo and he's in the other room. <laughs> super is he super acting loud like a cockapoo? For no reason. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but um, so early in my career when I was a recording engineer, I would get to know the artists really well. Um, as a mix engineer, I don't get to know them much at all because a lot of it is very distance communication out of that. And I think one of the gifts of what we do is figuring out how to figure those things out really quickly. And if you get good at keying in on people really quickly, that's the gift of it. And I don't have to be around somebody long to know. And, and then there's certain things that are pretty constant where like most artists, you know, they like their vocals pretty loud or you kind of get a sense of what the, the person is sensitive about, what the person gravitates to. You can lock into that kind of stuff fairly quickly based on what they talk about and one of the key things for me i remember when i first met pharrell i met him via phone of uh, when he was first looking for somebody to mix you know to a diff, try out different mixers and our first conversation we had and he started telling me about the feel of records and how he likes things to feel like the 70s and that he started naming off records so i was writing down all the records he was naming and i went and studied so it's easy to kind of lock in and figure out what somebody likes if you pay attention. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. That 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 EQ is super duper important to develop. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, this is from this question is from Linhart ninety seven. Thank you so much for subscribing again. Um, and her question is, from listening to music, what would you say has influenced your mixing the most? Um. Interesting. Um, I think what influences my mixes the most is understanding two things, that fundamentals can be a huge part of what you do. It's not necessarily about all the tricks and all the gadgets and all the fancy plugins. It's the fundamentals. It's levels. It's panning. Those things can make you feel things just by levels. Um, and, and it's feel. It's understanding the records that I was, when I was younger, the records that made me feel something. There was something about those mixes, like whether it's Off the Wall or Thriller or a lot of the Bob Marley records, like just the feel of those records were, was amazing and the mix played a part in it. So I think for me, um, listening and understanding how to convey feel through fundamentals, volume, slight you know, panics, like dipping volume in the strings here and then bringing the strings back up here or, you know, those things. A lot of, like I said, a lot of young engineers tend to rely on a lot of tricks and, you know, fancy plugins. And I'm like, no, the fundamentals is what gets you through. You know, if you, you've you seen my mixes, DK, you've seen how I mix and it's like the most basic, you know, I barely use any plugins, that kind of thing. It's a lot of people can't believe it, but it's relying on the fundamentals to create the feel. Is, is huge for me. It was so funny, if I may comment on that. Um, it was at the end of the week of Mix with the Masters, and I was talking to Victor, and maybe maybe it was, I'm pretty sure it was Victor. I was like, yo, you've seen a lot of these. How was Leslie's week? And he gave me the funniest answer ever. He said, it was so good, but I'm kind of disappointed. And I was like, why? Well, the week before was Andrew Shep's, where it was like really, really complicated and a lot of good insight. And then here comes Leslie, that simplifies everything so much that I don't know. I don't know. Like what? The, I don't know how to feel about it. Is kind of what he yeah, said. Yeah. And I thought that was like perfect. Um, and at that point in time, as I, I'm still a newer engineer, but at the point in time, I was definitely a newer engineer that that was exactly what I needed. Where it's just like, Oh, that's right. And you never teach it in a way that's, disrespectful like it's it's still a craft that you put a lot of time and effort into but Absolutely. no need to overthink it right <laughs> yeah yeah i love that i love that um this is uh, another good question this is from uh straight trippin here on twitch how did leslie get started in music 
get his first big break with someone big? Um, how I got started in music, I mean, if we go into the very, very, very beginning, when I was a kid, I would always uh, sneak out of the living room and listen to records all night. Um, my dad had these very huge, like, headphones that looked like pilots would wear them. <laughs> and I would wear those and just kind of listen to records, and, you know, check records and all that kind of stuff. Sorry about the dog, guys. I'm going to have to put him up. Can you, is he like, can you hear him? We can hear him, but don't worry. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's not, not overshadowing you. Okay. Yeah. Because he's getting on my nerves. But anyway, um, so I would listen to records. I would be dissecting what I hear in my headphones. And that became a part of my DNA for mixing. I think just listening to sounds, understanding sounds. Decide, uh, um, in high school, my guidance counselor would hear me complain all the time about how I didn't want to go to college. So then she found uh, Full Sail University. At the time, it was Full Sail Center for Recording Arts. Um, I went there, um, learned about all the different aspects of sound and realized that mixing was my thing. And then I moved to Atlanta and started interning at a studio. started interning at Dallas Austin's Recording Projects, known... Uh, affectionately as DARP Studios here in Atlanta. Um, I started intern. I started just anything I can do to be around, um, run and get coffee, run and get food, whatever the case may be, just to be in that environment. And just, I learned it, just worked my way up. And then it was um, making tape dupes and doing anything I can do to stay around. And then my really big break came. There, there were other groups that I worked with here and there, but my really big break came one night when TLC was recording a song and the engineer didn't show up. And then Tion was like, T-Boz, she and I had gotten cool just in general. She was like, well, Leslie can do it. He went to Full sale, And I was like, uh. And so I just got in there, started recording. And, you know, I made some mistakes that night, but we made it through the night. And what we learned that night and what Dallas learned that night is he really liked working with me. He And, and Tion really liked working with me. And we just had a vibe and he asked me to come back, you know, a couple of days later to record something else. And then I just became his recording engineer. And then it morphed into me mixing certain things and becoming his mix engineer. And then, you know, branching out from there. And other people who would come by the studio would see, oh, he's mixing Monica, he's mixing so-and-so. And then it would be like, um, Outcast would be like, you know, they would sign up a face, but they would be at the studio all the time. They were like, well, come mix this or, you know, so. That's amazing. That kind of thing. So did you go into DARP Studios? I mean, when did you decide you wanted to be an engineer specifically? Was there ever a point that you wanted to be a producer or like a beat maker or anything else? When I got to Full Sail, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I had no clue. I just knew I wanted to do music. I knew I wanted to be behind the scenes. By the time I got out of Full Sail, I realized, okay, mixing is what I want to do. I want to be an engineer. Um, so I, I had a very, you know, because when I went to Full Sail, when I got there, I was fresh out of high school. So I just didn't really have a clear vision as to what aspect of music I would be doing. But it cleared up and it came into focus as I was going through school. And During when that, I graduated, I was like, oh, I want to be a mixer. So so specifically, because I think that, if I'm not mistaken, mix being a mixer is still a relatively new thing within the last few decades or something like that. So at that time, you, it was still well enough known that you want to be a mixer, not an engineer. Yeah, I, I knew early on that I, I loved the engineering, the recording of it. But I also knew I looked up to guys who only mixed because I liked the craft of mixing. So, and, and they're, they're different types. There's some engineers who they have to do both. They have to record and mix the project. I always felt like I was going to evolve into only mixing. So how long did you actually like put in, how many years did you put in of just mostly recording before it kind of transitioned? Um, I recorded, so I got to DARP uh, in 92, graduated from Full Sail in 92. I recorded consistently up until about 95 and even some into 96 and a little into 97 but by 94 95 I was mixing here and there I think where the big pivotal shift came where I was only mixing I think that happened right in 97 98 and then since 98 I hadn't recorded it was just mixing so was it what do you recommend for anybody that likes mixing um 
And do you recommend everybody that wants to be a mixer start with recording or do you kind of recommend everybody to jump into mixing as soon as possible? Well, I don't, I don't recommend a specific path for any one person. I think that everybody's different. Um, I do think, and I have seen historically guys who understand and have dabbled in the fundamentals of recording do better at mixing, but I've seen people who have never recorded and then went straight to mixing and done okay. Um, I think it's about how much you grasp. I always think that you probably will get a better foundation recording and then moving into mixing, but I don't think there's any one prescribed path. And I think it's based on your personality, based on your aptitude, what you're able to learn and pick up. And I think it's all of that. So I, I would never prescribe a specific path for any one individual. It's always based on whatever works best for that person. Amazing. I remember one week, uh, one day during Mixed with the Masters, someone in the group asked, and this is a common question that I get as well. Um, and I changed my work habits because of this. Someone in the group asks, I've been doing a lot of producing and, and recording, but I want to switch over to completely mixing. And the question was, how do I do that? To switch mm-hmm. over from recording to now just mixing. Do you remember what you said or, or do you have different thoughts? Or? I, think I, I think if I remember what I said, I told them that one of the hard decisions you have to make is you got to stop recording. Um, and it's, I, I don't think, again, not prescribing this for every single person, but my method would be to stop recording because in the minds of the producers and the artists that see you, if they see you recording, they're not going to respect you as a mixer. And so it's a hard choice to make to try to cut off your recording and then start mixing. I think that's what I said. If, yeah, if I, yeah, or yeah. I said something along those lines. Um And I remember that in my own journey where I was a part of a situation where I was fortunate enough to be around Madonna when she came to the studio dark to work. She only saw me in a mixing capacity, even though I wasn't mixing her stuff. I was mixing Monica's stuff at the time. And the recording engineer who recorded her, Dallas also was going to use him to mix. And then she was like, no, he can't mix my stuff. And then I ended up getting the mix gig because that's the only thing she saw in her mind when she came, she always saw me mixing Monica stuff, but she saw me as a mixer. She never saw me recording. So in her mind, I wasn't a recording engineer. I was a mixer. In her mind, the guy who was recording her was a recording engineer. So I think it's important to kind of establish roles and who you are. Um, perception is everything. When people see you recording, I, I don't think they respect you as a mixer. That's so interesting. So it was immediately yeah. after that that I went home. And I think within the six months of coming home, I stopped recording completely. And I will have to say for the mm. first year, it was it financially sucks. more difficult. Yes, it, but it, it was financially funny. sucks. Yeah, but I remember <laughs> there were moments in the first year where people came to me and, and like weirdly respected me more in the local area just because I was like one of the first people in Utah to only mix. And Utah's not a big, like, music town or music state at all. So mm-hmm. it was just like, DK's the only one in the state that, like, only mixes. And that changed everything. And then after that, just kind of, like, snowball. So I remember taking and that think advice. Of, think of it in these terms. And I don't know if I put it in these terms and mix with a mess. But think of it in these terms. Imagine that you have, you know, God forbid, some kind of brain injury, right? You go to the hospital, and there are two surgeons. There's one that only focuses on the brain. All he operates on is the brain. That is all he does. So another surgeon, he does the brain, the heart, the appendix. Which surgeon are you going to choose? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to choose going the, the one heart. that only operates on brains because that's the thing you feel like he's the best at because it's the only thing he does. You see what I'm saying? So it's and and that applies to in different like if you go to a if you got a problem with the brakes in your car and you go to a place that only specializes in brakes. Nine times out of ten, you're going to have more confidence in that place than the place that does paint jobs, brakes, transmission, auto glass, tinting. You know, that place may not be great at any one of those things. But that brake place, if that's all they do is brakes, you're probably going to have a lot of confidence that your brakes are going to be good. So I think that's the mentality, too, is subconsciously people tend to attach this notion that you're a specialist 
in mixing if that's the only thing you do. I, I think this is a good segue into another question that I have. I think this is something that we kind of bring up for debate, debate, but I'd love to hear your opinion is, uh, your opinion, Leslie, is we we understand the importance of perception. Unfortunately, that's a big deal, the aesthetics, the perception and how you're perceived. Um, in relation to how good you are at your craft versus the perception that you have or the people skills that you have, what's kind of the ratio of importance? Um... I think they go hand in hand. And I think as long as the perception does not outweigh the ability, like I think it's okay to create a buzz and to have this perception that you're a great mixer, but you also got to be a great mixer. And I've seen <laughs> yeah. too many times where an engineer would get famous because of who they were associated with in the recording phase and then they mix one record and then a lot of people start coming to them, but then they're not really that good as a mixer yet. And so I think it's important to try to catch up to that expectation really quickly. And if you know that rush is coming, I'm not saying avoid it. I'm saying once you know that buzz is coming, now you got to work really hard at your craft. You got to get good because then other people are perceiving you as a mixer. It's like you got to. So, for instance, I remember when I first mixed Monica's Don't Take It Personal, right? Her first record, this is a 1994 and then Madonna starts coming around at the end of 94 and seeing me mixing Monica. And all of a sudden there's chatter that, oh, Madonna might want to fly you out to mix Power of Goodbye or X, Y, and Z. So now I knew I had to like catch up and get really good at my craft and really hone in on things because I didn't want to go out to L.A. and not be who she thought I was. And not to fake it. I wasn't going to try to go out there and do all kind of elaborate tricks and da da This is who you're getting. And if you hiring me to mix... You know, know that I'm a little raw, but, you know, I know how to deliver a feel and X, Y, and Z. So I think as long as the ability matches the hype, um, I think it's okay. Um, I've seen a lot of situations where the hype outweighs the ability, and that's obviously not good. Absolutely. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, let's see. So there is a question from Pixel Pixel. It says, uh, how do you retain your own sound or style as an engineer whilst working with multiple mix preferences with multiple clients? Also, are you supposed to slash should be aiming at developing a sound like that? Well, I think for me, I think that's a mistake that a lot of engineers make is they, they always want, it's, it's again, ego. They want to be involved. They want to, this is my sound. And I'm like, no, it's about what the artist wants. It's about, for me, and again, I don't think this approach works for everybody. I know there's some engineers that will tell you you should be developing a sound and then da da da. But I don't believe that. I believe that it's about good work. It's about giving the artist what they want. It's about honing in, listening to what works for that artist and delivering the mix that they want. It's not about, I got to give them my signature sound. I don't believe in that. I believe in crafting whatever sound is necessary for the artist that you're working on. Okay. So I have a totally different way of thinking when than a lot of people. There's, there are a lot of engineers who would tell you it's important to develop a sound and blah, blah, blah. I don't subscribe to that theory. And I don't think either one of us is wrong or right. I just think it's just what works for, you know, every person. For me, I like to give the artist and the producer and the label what they're looking for. It's not about me. Hmm. Hmm. I like that. I, I, as a observation, it's really interesting to me when I first saw you mix, um, that eventually I knew we were going to talk about this is how little you actually do. Mm -hmm. And I know you charge a pretty penny. So it's like, at first, when I first saw, I was like, Whoa, the people are paying so much for barely anything. But then the more you started explaining it, just like that, like they're yeah, also they're, paying partially. What they're paying for is all my experience. They're not paying for me to do a whole bunch and take a whole lot of time doing it. They're paying for experience. And sometimes experience is knowing what to do and what not to do. Because you can unmix a song. You've heard me say this before. You can unmix a song just as much as you mixed it. So all of what you're paying me for is the experience of knowing what to do and what not to do. And sometimes what not to do kind of shines. Sometimes it's, it doesn't need a whole lot. 
Sometimes it's just one little thing that it needs. But the thing is, you didn't know that thing, so you had to pay me. It's no different from if if you take your car into the mechanic and the only thing that's wrong with your car is it needs a new spark plug and you look at the bill and you go, why did you charge me $500 just to change a spark plug? I could have done that myself. Yes, you could have physically changed the spark plug your, yourself, but I don't have the knowledge to diagnose that the spark plug is what was needed. That's the, what you're paying for. You're paying for the knowledge to know what to do. You're not paying for the actual physical act. Because if you've ever put a spark plug in a car, it's not the hardest thing in the world to do. But you have to know about spark plugs and know that that was the specific problem. And a spark plug is no bigger than this mouse. So it seems as if it's a relatively large price for a small thing, but you're not paying for the thing. You're paying for the experience and knowing where to put the thing, knowing that that was the actual problem to begin with, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing with mixing, where you're not paying for me to come in and do a million things to your drums. Sometimes you're coming in for me to come in and take out six of your kicks and just let one sit there. <laughs> that, that might be the thing that makes your mix shine, and I've done that yeah. before. You've, you've seen me post about that before, where I had a producer say, man, I had like eight kicks going. I mean, what, how'd you make it sound so amazing? I took out seven of them. <laughs> yeah. That was what you paid me for. For you real. You paid me for that experience and knowledge of knowing that you just had too many damn kicks in your song. <laughs> so, so I do have a question on that, just because um, from a mastering engineer standpoint, just super unfiltered opinion and everything. Now, with your level of experience and everything, I'm sure that you've had records where your master bounce is the one that's released. And then I'm guessing there's been a few that go to a mastering engineer. Well, what have you seen be the relationship style or the communication style between you and mastering engineers or where you've landed in those situations? Because obviously your experience has influenced a lot of the final product to your mix. But mm -hmm. when there's now, I guess, an added cook or assistant or whatever to the situation that comes after your mix, where does the communication land? Do you always get to communicate? Do you not always get to communicate? Like, how have you well, kind of worked with mastering engineers? Well, the thing is, every mix, I'm, every mix I do gets mastered. Um, it's usually Colin Leonard. You, you kind of develop these relationships with the mastering engineers. If you're a top mixer, you're going to be dealing with the top mastering engineers most of the time. So it's just, you, you, there's a group of mastering engineers that my, my records are either going to Colin Leonard, Chris Athens, Dave Kutch. There's, there's a select few, Chris Garrett, you know, there's a select few of, of uh, mastering engineers. Most of my mixes go to Colin because that's what I would recommend. And they'll ask me, they'll say, well, who do you usually use or who do you like to master your records? And because Colin and I have that language that you're talking about, we did take time developing that language through. I remember the first time he mastered something for me, I was mixing, I think it was a record by Drummer Boy. Mm -hmm. And the record came back and I was like, yo, this sounds dope. And I was like, I, I remember I'd never heard of Colin. And I hit him up and I was like, yo, you did an amazing job on, job on this drummer record. And his response to me was, but I would love to master more records for you. I'd love for us to build a relationship. I like what you do. Your mix was amazing. And then we just started talking and I just started sending projects to him. And I started realizing every project I said, he nails it. And I was like, oh, he's the guy. So and, and Chris Athens, too. And, and Chris Athens and Colin are actually friends. Colin, I think, came up under Chris Athens. But Chris Athens, same way. I remember the very first time I used Chris Athens, I think he was a, a favorite of the Def Jam crew. And so when I was mixing stuff like Jeezy and other records, they would always be like, send it to Chris Athens. And then I started realizing, like, yo, this dude does a great job. I love how he, you know, masters these records. And then I reached out to Chris and was like, yo, like, you know, Tell me if I need to do anything better or worse. And he was like, no, your mixes are amazing. Like, I love, you know. So it's always about having that language. And then, like I said, once you develop that thing, you just know what you're getting. I know when I send a record to Colin, it's going to sound amazing. I don't even listen to the masters now. Like, even on, like, Jack Harlow or other albums that I've mixed recently, I don't listen to the masters because I know what he's going to do. I know they're going to be great. Just so out of curiosity just, on that. You know, do they change much about it? Because I know there's uh, different preferences between different people. Like some people want the mastering engineer to essentially not be audible, you know, 
right. just as transparent as it can. Like if they send it back exactly the same, like no changes, they'd probably be happy with that. And then there's other people that want the the tailored touch. How has your you know preference been? I know you're very much about whatever the client wants. I know yes. working with some people, and they really tell me like about, as long as the client's happy. What is your preference? Really, it's about knowing that specific thing about that master engineer. So for instance, with Colin, I know he's going to do a few things. He's going to make it as loud as possible. He's going to make sure he keeps the integrity of the low end. He's going to make it slam as much as possible, but he's not going to crush the low end. He's going to keep that low end pumping through and he's going to keep the clarity on the top. And those are the three things I care about. Make it loud. Make sure you don't compress my low end and make sure that clarity comes through on the top. We are good. And he does that. Chris Athens, same thing. Other master engineers have different styles of like compressing stuff really hard, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so I won't necessarily recommend them or I know, okay, if it goes to this guy, it might come back a little over compressed or X, Y, and Z. So yeah, dif- different mastering engineers have different styles that you know what you're getting. And that's why I would recommend Collins because I know he's going to do those three things. You know what I mean? He's going to make it loud. He's going to take care of the low end. He's going to make sure the top end is still shining. Last question about so. your final mixes and stuff like that on my end, only because I've exactly. always heard a different answer on this. Um, wow. Do you ever, two part of question, do you ever mix for a certain loudness? And when you do, because some people will actually just drop a limiter or just lower the volume before sending it off to your mastering engineers. How, like, do you have a target loudness for yourself being that you go for mastering engineers and do you send it with a limiter or without a limiter? What has become more of the norm now is that the producers and the artists want to hear it with a certain loudness before it even goes to mastering. So I tend to, I may run the mixes to a limiter or something. I don't, I haven't done it a lot in the past, but I've started to do it more now. And then what I would do is drop the level right before I send it to mastering so that they still have headroom to do what they do. Um, Because sometimes when you put a limiter on there or you put some type of mastering plugin on there, it also colors the mix. It, it gives a certain edge or a compression or clarity to the mix that if you take it off and send it to the mastering engineer, the mix will be different. So I want the mix to be as close to what they approved. And then I just adjust the volume to give the mastering engineer some headroom. Gotcha. Uh, if I do put a limiter or something on there. Uh, but there are mixes still where I don't, where I don't put anything on the master. DK has actually seen me mix things where I don't put anything on the master affair. And sometimes I've, I've, like I said, I've started putting a couple of things or trying a couple of things here and there just because we're in the loudness wars and that's where producers are. That's where artists are, where everything got to be loud. And, you know, I just be like, yeah, did everybody lose their volume knobs? Like, why is, that, <laughs> you know, why is loudness the focus of every producer and artist? And I'm just like, you know, you have a volume knob, you know, you can turn it up. Like I hate th- that 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 comment when when an artist or producer goes, yeah, everything sounds great, but it's just not loud enough. I'm like, a, it's not master. The b, you have a volume knob. Like, you can use it. It's okay. You know. That Are you kind. very vocal with the client about that? Like, I'm just curious. Like, I know you. I know you. Like you said that you're. Um, you'll let them know you, you're pretty you, raw. You have to measure. Stuff. You have to measure personalities. And so yeah. what I mean by that is, there's certain people who you you know they're just gonna want it the way they want it. Um, yeah. Certain people, there is no discussions on the book. Like, for instance, you work with Kanye. Kanye wants it how Kanye wants it. There's no room for discussion. When yeah. you work with somebody yeah. like Pharrell, he's always open to conversation. Or you know, there you go. So it's personality yeah. based as well. You got to kind of pick your spots, know who you're talking to, know who you're dealing with. Alex, kind of I love I love your very service oriented method of your work. Like. I always tell people be of service when it comes to your work, but I really appreciate that. That seems to be the yeah. number one thing on your books. It's about what they want, and it's about knowing how to talk to each client the way that's going to be the most effective. Yeah. So this is a question from Farzam. Um, what are your favorite compressors to use on vocals and drums? Also, when do you decide not to use a compressor? Um, on vocals, I usually use um, the Renaissance um, compressor. Um, With a 17 lightly. attack and a 177 release at a 1.77. There you go. 
I, I actually, I, I'm not going to lie, I have a setting on my computer. DK told me about this. He showed it to me. He applied it. I heard it. I saved it. And as the title, I put, what the fuck, Leslie? <laughs> <laughs> so I kid you not it's it's just on a default recall not because it's like a templated thing it's just like why did this work That's so funny. well <laughs> how did yeah. you come up with that one just again it, if you notice the settings it's very light it's very yeah. low key my my theory on compression and this is with most instruments if you can hear the compressor working you're compressing too much that's my theory especially with vocals if you can hear the compressor you're doing too much. So it's about light settings just to control things. Um, and then on my main buses, I usually try to put like a Fairchild 670 Legacy on there. I love that thing. And sometimes I just default that thing. I just throw it on there and it just gives it a presence and a balance. And, you know, so I'm, I'm not the most complicated engineer. Cool. I, somewhere in this notebook, I have your exact chain that you were using at the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, though. Um, I also, I do, because of you, I, I love the Fairchild 670 Legacy Edition. I love what it does to the mid-range. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. so interesting. Um, and and to the second part of that question is, when do you decide not to use a compressor? When it's not necessary. When when I don't feel like <laughs> anything is going too crazy. Um, if things sound consistent or if it sounds pretty good just on its own, then I decide not to. Do you ever use a compressor for like transient shaping at that point? Do you use it uh, like, um, I guess, as like a so coloration much. tool? Sometimes, but not so much. And that would probably be more the job of the Fairchild in a sense of just bringing things out up um, some presence. But I don't go too deep into what I'm trying to shape on the top end. I like to let the top end be what it is. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and just and then it's, for me, it's about controlling levels, like which things should be louder, which things should be softer, that kind of thing. Do you ever use clippers? No. Okay. Not a not a clipper type of guy. That's in life awesome. Or in basketball. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna go into the next question here. Um, do you have consistent? This is from Straight Trip, and do you have consistent reference songs? Um, and if so, what are they? Um, yes. And let me preface this answer by saying my answers are probably not going to work for you. And what I mean by that is reference is about a frame of reference. So the reasons why a specific group of songs are going to work for me is because they're songs that I know inside and out. I've heard them my whole life. I've heard them in a lot of different environments. I know how to dis dissect bass, mid range and high end based on these specific records because I know those records so well. This list of records is going to be different for every person. So I don't, I am going to answer the question, but I don't want you to take the answer as this is the holy grail. This answer is only going to apply to me because these records are specific to me and my studying. Some of them may intersect with records on your list, but your list is really about what records do you know that you've dissected in multiple environments that you know you could use a standard records to reference environments that being said my list usually involves on um, a tribe called quest low end theory that the whole album i mean mm -hmm. i can reference any record on that album for low end and understand what the low end is doing in that room again because i've listened to that album so many times so i have a very specific intricate knowledge and relationship with what the low end is doing on that on that album to be able to know what it's doing in a specific space. Um, Thriller, Michael Jackson, I, I know that album pretty solidly inside and out, so I can reference on speakers um, how it sounds. And I think the one that would probably inch up in that category as well is um, Portishead's Dummy. I, I love that album and I've listened to it so many times that I have a very keen sense of where all the sounds sit and where each sound should be and that kind of thing. So th for me, those three albums. It's interesting. I like the way that you preface that in the sense that it's not going to work for you. The, the Tribe Called Quest album, you've been listening to that, I assume, since the retro headphone days. Yeah, since it came out. <laughs> yeah, so like, there you go. I think that's a big thing too, where people are familiar with different sounds and tones. And yeah, so I, I really love that. I love that. 
Um, this is a question from, it's Ricky Suave that says, I might want to change the wording of this, but it says, what's Leslie's chain for the low end? Or, or what are your typical processes for low end? Low end, um, I'm always going to go to, first and foremost, you know the answer to this, DK. You know the first thing I'm going to go to is the Little Labs, Voice of God. Um, I love that thing. I love it for low end shaping. A lot of times I use it on 808s, kicks, bases. Um, it's just a real good low end resonance shaping tool. It's very simple. I love. I like, and, it, and you'll notice something about me, even in the plugins I name. If it's a complicated plugin, I usually just go with the default, or I like very simple plugins, plugins with one knob or two. That's why the, the one knob series from Waves, best thing since sliced bread. I love the fact that they actually had a plugin series called the one knob, and they all got one knob that does one thing, and you just turn the knob and the thing happens. I think that's the most brilliant concept in um, cause, cause if you know me, you know, I like simplicity. So, uh, the little voice of God, the little lab voice of God has two knobs on it. I think, um, other things for low end shape. Every now and then I'll break out the submarine, the wave submarine. That thing is, it's a bit of a beast. I don't use it much. Um, yeah. That's exciting. That's about it. I have a, I have a oh, question. I, I have one more. I'm sorry. Oh. I, I left out the, um, the pull tech, the PE. I forgot what was the pull tech one. The PQ one, EQP one. I forgot what one. Yeah, yeah the but it's the pull tech EQ. Um, it's the the legacy one. Uh, I tend yeah. to like. I like jumping to that one as well. The pull tech stuff. I love how it sounds and how meaty so, and fat. Just out of curiosity, UAD, you, you, just out of curiosity, because you brought up the voice of God. Um, you know, the reason I got into that one myself, I'm actually. a big lover of that one uh but i actually was introduced to the hardware before the plugin i didn't realize it was a plugin the whole time i was using the hardware um and that kind of prompts the question of are you much of a hardware guy yourself i believe you're mainly in the box like how do you how do you prefer to keep your workflow efficient yeah i i have used the gear the hardware gear um way back in the day but um actually right now I am mm-hmm. super in the box. I don't like gear. I don't like external gear. I'm not one of those long live analog guys. Yeah. I think analog sucks. It's just too much trouble. It's too much noise. Sh- you know, stuff breaks. I, I have that analog. written down as a quote in my notebook. Analog, analog yeah. sucks. Uh, <laughs> analog sucks. <laughs> it's analog, quote. Analog sucks. Analog sucks. It's, um, it sucks. I'm, I'm going to use the restroom real quick, but keep going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Analog sucks. Um, I love everything about technology and digital and how easy things are to manipulate. And I think the plugin companies like UAD has made it, um, made, um, good sound more achievable. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I I have used the voice of God, the actual gear. And like I said, I have used real gear in my early career in the nineties. Obviously I've used that real life auto tune, um, before the actual piece, the actual unit. Um, and I used to use the PU1C. I used to, most of the pieces of gear, most of the plugins I use, I have actually used a piece of gear. And that's why I was super impressed with UAD because of how close and how good the plugins sound to the actual gear. But absolutely no outboard gear. I'm all in the box. I can mix my entire situation on my laptop. All I have is my laptop and my Apollo. That is it. Nice. And of course, I use my speakers, but laptop and Apollo. That's it. Now, I've got two questions for you on that, because I did notice the Apollo. um, And you know how it goes. There's guys that are all about every single last converter on the market. It has to be compared a thousand times over which one does best at what. But I haven't really heard that about you. Now, one thing that somebody did ask, I'm forgetting who it is. uh, I believe Farzam asked about. Oh, someone uh, earlier did ask about clocks. Yeah, clocks. That you actually use a different clock when printing your bounce um, and your process to that, if that's even the case, is that something that you dive into? I know no, analog gear, not to, necessarily, but clocks? There was a time when I was, I did try out using a different clock at one point. Um, I believe I had a, yeah, I still have it. I just don't use it. It was an antelope uh, clock. 
Um, was it like the Orion yeah, or yeah, the Atom one? The uh, Atomic Clock. The Atomic Clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot which one it was, but I used it. Um, it is. I mean, when you clock, um, there is a slight difference. It sounds a little better. All that good stuff. So I'm not knocking the art of clocking and printing with a clock and all that kind of stuff. However, I just it's just not convenient. And for the volume of stuff I mix and for how people want, you know, stuff turned around. I mean, Jack just came to me a week ago and was like, hey, man, we need you on the rest of the album. You've got to be turned in by which the date was um, last Monday in order to deliver on this Friday. You know what I mean? Like, so it's. Yeah. I don't have the time to try to be too nuanced about things like clocking. It does sound a little better. But I mix hip hop driven music and hip hop isn't supposed to sound perfect. And I like the imperfect and I like the raw and I'm good with just printing directly in the box, just using my Apollo. The only thing I use my Apollo for is to process the UAD plugins. And it's also my monitoring, you know, to hear the, do the it's my converter to hear the audio. But other than that, I'm not super big on all the nerdy, like, technical. It has to sound the best and has to be the best sounding clock ever. That shit doesn't matter. Like, at the end of the day, like... Yeah. I know uh, a lot of guys who are super... Say it again? Excuse me. Oh, no. I was going to say, I know a lot of guys who are super technical, super into all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I'm happy with the plaques that I've generated. And, uh, Without <laughs> You know. with, with that said, like, uh, so obviously you've you've tested and true gear, clocks, uh, now we've discussed. Now, you mentioned that all you need is your Apollo, your laptop, and your monitors. Now, I heard a funny story where you'd rather die than mix on Genelex. And that's, oh, no, no, no. I think no, the, is quote it? Was, the quote was, I'd rather jump off a bridge before I mix on <laughs> Now, that's, I would that's okay. I would rather jump off a bridge and die before I mix on Genelex. Absolutely. Now... If you don't mind me asking, I know this can change with time because there's always something new on the market or something that's always just worked out for different people. What monitors do you like and what do you like about them? I absolutely love the Focals. Mm-hmm. I've loved them ever since I've heard them. Um, they just they deliver such tight, clean, low end. Um, the high end never changes, and that's because the, the tweeters are made out of beryllium, and beryllium does not change. It's... Um, it, they they just sound amazing, and they don't fatigue my ears. And that's the one thing I love. I can I can run them at a decent level, and they just don't fatigue my ears. Um, and they just have a really tight. Um, they're built well. They understand sound well. All the focals I've heard in the in the higher range, like professional um, minor space, whether it's the the ones I use, the ones I have right here, the twin six BEs. Um, I've had, uh, I have a pair of trios um, uh, down at Full Sail. I have used the SM9s. All of those sound amazing. Absolutely amazing. Have you ever like branched out of them and then went back to Focal or what has like, you know, DK I've and I have kind of gone tried. through a monitor journey, if you'd call it that, you know? Yeah, I've tried a few. I, I tried the Adams. Uh, Adams are a little brittle for my taste. Mm-hmm. Um, I've tried the Barefoots. Those are a little heavy for my taste. Um, but nothing feels as familiar and great as the Focals for my ears and for me. Nothing feels like them. Fair. Yeah, I heard uh, d- at the pandemic you were using them in your truck. Yeah, I took the <laughs> Twin Sixes in my truck. I mixed uh, a WAP. I mixed that in the truck. Um, <laughs> wow. What's popping? Um, yeah, what's popping? I finished up in the truck. Brand new um, yeah. just locked in. That's right. Facts. <laughs> I got options. I have to ask now, like, okay, now I'm trying to visualize this. Were you in the driver's seat with them in the no, back? So what Were I you did, in the trunk laying on your stomach, mixing on a keyboard? Like, <laughs> No, so what I did is I have a Cadillac Escalator. It has three rows. Mm-hmm. So I was sitting in the third row. I had the captain's chairs in the second row flipped down. And then I put some cushions on top of those and then put the speakers on the cushions. So as I sit in the third row, the speakers are like right there on the flip down captain's chairs. And then I just got, I had like a little desk that had very short legs that can fit right over it, almost like a, like a, it looked like a glorified eating tray. 
Okay. That would like you would sit over your legs on a bed or something. I had that. And then I just had my laptop and my Apollo and I would sit there in a truck in the third row chilling and it was like my office and I I've never it. heard a more luxurious mix room ever in Escalade <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so to, I know a lot of people have talked about that and it, it kind of made some memes and whatnot it was awesome um, but for you was that just pragmatic like did you not have a setup in the home yet or like I didn't have a setup in the home yet and COVID was pretty rapid and pretty much like okay you can't go in the studio nobody can go anywhere we're quarantined but I had to get work done and I didn't have this room right now. I have a room set up in the house, but I didn't have things set up. I didn't treat the corners and I have like, you know, panels that I put up. And over time you sit in a room and you put up different soundproofing elements and da da da. I didn't have that. Um, before, like I have stuff on my ceiling right here. I got soundproofing around. Um, so, I, you know, and also it was, it was practical and pragmatic from a standpoint of, you know, saying, hey, you know, let's let me try mixing in the truck, see how I like it, because it became my own office. Because the other thing is now I got to share the house with three other people, my wife and my daughters. And they're going to homeschool. My wife is upstairs in her office. I mean, my wife still work both from home, but we're on opposite sides of the house. So that's good. She's upstairs on that side and I'm downstairs on this side. But my kids are here and mixing a song like WAP. I can't mix that around my daughters, so <laughs> I got to find a location to where they can't hear what I'm working on. So, so how, how's that been for you? Have you? Are you mixing almost full time from home now? I mean, I'm mixing not even almost absolutely full time. Obviously, I'm not mixing in the truck anymore. I moved from the truck into this room, like I said. But I love mixing from home. I, everything uh, yeah, I was gonna say, how's that mentality shift? You enjoy mixing from it's home? Been amazing. The only one thing I miss is the camaraderie at the studio with the fellas. Mm. And we, we kind of meet up at the studio every now and then to kind of keep that going. And I'm on the phone every day with Canon and we keep, you know, we keep our communication alive. And, but other than that, and Canon and I are both kind of like the same person. We're, we're introverts and we like being at the studio, but we like the nerdy stuff. And we like drum machines and sitting around with Pro Tools. And I got my DJ equipment right here. So I just, this is my space and it's my comfort zone. Like, I don't really like people. I don't want to go to the studio. I don't want everybody smoking weed and drinking. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't like none of that stuff. Like, I don't really like people. I'm an introvert. You know, I, I just I just want to now say that Leslie is now my idol. <laughs> like, I've, I've never heard a more accurate depiction as to my personality. Yeah. <laughs> like, holy yeah. shit. Yeah. So, like, it's not like even people. mean. It's just it's just personal preference at that yeah. point. Yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, and I this- also realized this is one key factor. I also realized this is what was the game changer for me. Working from home, I actually get way more work done. I realized that at the studio, I wasted a lot of time. And here's why. At the studio, there's 20 people who speak my language. I can have three conversations about kick drums. I can have a conversation about sampling and all this stuff that lasts, you know, 45 minutes, two hours at home. Nobody gives a shit about what I do. They don't we they don't speak my language. So I get my work done and then I'm out there watching Encanto or something with the girls or you know, that's the <laughs> yeah. thing. So at home I get so much more done. And at the studio I waste so much time talking. <laughs> How many times have you watched Encanto now all the way through? Um, I think I'm on probably two hundred and fifty six, maybe. <laughs> that's uh, it? Yeah, so, that's amazing. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so uh, tonight, we're running out of time. Tonight will be 257. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're running out of time here. Oh, did it, I wonder oh, wait, if the did video... freeze up? It looks like it's frozen up a little bit. Oh, but uh, I'm wondering, we're, we're running out of time here. I don't want to do more than... And we're really, really grateful for any time that you give to us. But I want to ask a uh, last few very important questions here um, as you're kind of getting the camera going again. Is... Uh, this is from Elijah, and he has a two-part question. I'm only going to ask the second part, which is, what gets you up in the morning? What keeps you motivated? Uh, Starbucks. That's a good answer. And Yeah. <laughs> um, hold on, I'm trying to adjust my camera because now I'm like, oh. No, right, we'll do a little edit here. here I'm going to do a little clap. There and he's back. So we're going to do another clap? Go. I'm back. So what gets you up in the morning? 
Um, I just love music. I think that's the un- the underlying thing about mixing and what we do is I I just love the craft of mixing. I love music. I absolutely love music. So, um, the the freedom of being able to do something you love and not have to walk within the normal constraints of what a lot of people have to experience in life where they have to get up and do a job they don't like to make money to survive the freedom of not having to do that is amazing so my question i have um this is this is something that i have struggled with from time to time a very first world philosophical problem um how do you maintain gratitude and and love for your work has there ever been times where it starts to feel stagnant or your love for music feels weak almost like a burnout yeah um, have you ever been burned out and how do you maintain because i really feel that you are very passionate about music how do you maintain that um i think for me the key to not getting burned out is i always have fun and even in the micro even when you look at just your day of mixing I may be mixing a record that I don't really like. And then I just take a lot of breaks and play Call of Duty a lot. and But I get through it. Or So it's always about having fun and making sure that this is fun. And I think now in my career, I've, I've gravitated more towards not dealing with clients that I don't like. When I feel like a client is about to be a headache, I'd be like, no, nah, I'm good. And, it's, and it doesn't, it becomes less about the money and the earning and more about the passion of it and yes i still want to earn and make money and provide for my family but i also don't want to be stressed so it's it's easier to make decisions on based on if i'm gonna enjoy it or not um but yeah getting burned out for me is it's it's easy not to because i have other things to focus on i like other things i you know build legos i you know play call of duty and then i go hang out with my family and then you know we don't um we we try to do a few vacations a year and i try to go pretty ham on our vacations i like you know so it's it's just about the my thing is quality i might not we may go on maybe only two trips this year or maybe three but they're gonna be quality trips they're gonna be fun i'm very much into i'm the dad in the pool with the kids when all the other dads are on their phones and checking emails i'm when i'm on vacation i'm on vacation i'm checked out so i think it's about also being very much into what you're into and knowing how to take breaks. And, and the, the biggest thing to answer your question is knowing how to care for yourself. Self-care is important. Knowing how to, when you wake up and you know you're not going to have a good day, if you if you have the time to put a mix off until the next day, sometimes it's, it's worth it. You know, knowing how to take care of your, your mental health. So for you specifically, what are ways that you found? Oh, maybe, may, hold on, wait, let me ask this a little bit better. Part one. What mm-hmm. kind of things have you found to be cathartic for you and good for your mental health? Mm-hmm. Two, how long did it take for you to discover that you enjoy these things? Um, for me, it was very early on um, in the discovery process. So what I mean by that is I knew, I always knew who I was at, from a very early age. So you heard me joke earlier about the fact that I don't like people been that way my whole life I've, I've always known i was i was a nerd when it wasn't popular to be a nerd in the 80s it wasn't popular to be a nerd a nerd was looked at as you know a negative thing but i was always comfortable being who i was i walked around with a backpack and all i had in my backpack was a red sports car and a rubik's cube i had a saxophone i was nerdy i had thick glasses and i loved it i loved who i was and i loved that i played video games I would sit in, my mom worked by an airport, so I would sit and watch the planes land and take off. That was my fun hobby thing to do. So even now, it's funny, I found a way to bring my happy place. So for instance, I may be mixing. I have three screens in front of me. On the central screen, I'm mixing. On the screen to the right, I always have a YouTube live video of some airport. It may be LAX or, I I typically tend to, play the, the live LAX feed most of the time. And it's just a bunch of, you know, heavies, um, heavy aircraft landing and taking off. They usually focus on the heavies. They focus on like the 747s or the A330s or the, the big 777s. And I just love watching planes land and take off. And it's something I did as a kid that was my happy place. I would go out on this little stoop 
and I would watch the planes take off and land at the air, by the airport because my mom, like I said, worked right by the airport. And it was just my happy place. And I would just sit there and I would listen to music and I would watch the planes take off. So even now when I'm mixing, right now on the screen next to me is a live feed of LAX with planes landing and taking off. And it's just, that's, that's my way of creating my happy space. Have you seen yeah. Wayne's World when they're on the, the, the hood of their car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. What well, you I, don't know I, is I, I that it has that on the like, screen. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I do that from time to time. Like I go to Orlando a lot. Or when I go to different cities, I've been to Dallas. I've, I've always, when I have time in a city, if I'm there for a few days or eat, sometimes on vacation, but a lot of times if I'm there for business or for something specific, I will find the places that I can go plane spotting. I would sit, you know, outside the landing path of an airport and just watch planes land and sit there and eat my lunch or, you know, that's just my thing. That's so, so. funny. I do the same thing with my three-year-old. He loves watching. We go to the Burbank airport like 10 minutes away like right next to the strip and just watch planes go up and down. He loves Plane it. Plane spotting is something I've always loved. And it's just, it's a, literally right now I have on my screen the LAX live feed right now. <laughs> that, is that is nerdy. That is nerdy. Yeah, it's super nerdy. Yeah. You know. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. Um, I think we want to leave off with this. Um, we have a bunch of different listeners on this show. And your teachings have influenced me, and I teach a lot of the same things that you teach or once passed down to me. Um, I, w- I think we'd all love to hear three different pieces of advice. One is from a beginner standpoint. One is from an intermediate standpoint. And one is from a more advanced standpoint, maybe making a living already from music. Um, okay. What are your three levels of advice? Three levels of advice from a beginner standpoint. Um, always be geared towards learning. Always, always, always be in that gear of learning. Um, learning every craft, every part of your craft, but also learning human behavior, learning, you know, what people like, what they don't like, you know, how, you know, learning is, is to me the, the key word for the beginner. For the intermediate, I would say the the advice from the four agreements is probably going to kick in the best and the most, which is not taking things personal. That That's where you, because once you learn some things and you get some traction in your career, one of the things that holds a lot of young engineers and producers up is taking a lot of stuff personal. So learning how not to take things personal, I think is a huge, that is one of the best of the four agreements in my opinion is learning how not to take things personal. And then for the more advanced part of your career, uh, understanding that all the things you've learned and all the technical knowledge that goes into your craft, it's less about learning the gear and it's more about learning the craft. And I always say, learn the craft, focus less on the gear, because the gear changes. The craft pretty much stays the same. So I think in your advanced years, focus more on the craft and focus more on feel and not just all the technical stuff. Cause in your advanced years, you can tend to get very like, Oh, I know how to do all this stuff and learn more gear, learn more plugins. I don't know, but it's about feel and, and you know, that kind of stuff. That's what I would say. Perfect. Well, I think that's a great end to this podcast. Yeah. Um, once again, we're really, really grateful for all the time uh, that you put into this. Thank you for all the content that you make outside of this. I'm sure many people are listening right now that have watched some of your YouTube videos and different things. So, um, will we yeah, see I'm you always at- on YouTube and that kind of stuff? And um, you can find me on Twitch, Lester Bud on Twitch. I'm on there pretty much every night playing Call of Duty. I answer questions about audio and everything in between. So that's right. So one more time, that's Twitch.tv backslash Lester Bud. L e s t e r b u d. Um, yeah, there you go. So check out Leslie. If you want to ask him more questions, go on to his stuff, go on to his, uh, um, Twitch stream and I'll plug it in for anybody that's watching right now. Um, that's kind of it. I'm, we're really grateful for all of your time, all your effort. We hope that we do another one later sometime in the future. And then, uh, also, uh, Nam, are you going to Nam next month? I think I'm going to Nam. I got to figure out my, it's in June, right? It's June. First yeah, week of June. Uh, Third, fourth, yeah, fifth, so, I believe it is. Yeah, I think I should be able to finagle that. So 
I've been asked. Um, I think um, Antares wants me to do something. Wade oh. wants me to do something. I'll be so. at the Antares booth. Uh, they asked me to rep for them for two days. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, I'm supposed to do. Um, um, what's his name? Heinrich. Um, who, who yeah, Heinrich. Yeah, yeah. With the masters. Yeah. Yeah, Henrik uh, asked me to do something via email the other day. So It's actually kind of funny story about the Antares booth. Uh, so the way me and DK met is through Henrik, which I did not know was at Mix with the Masters with DK. DK went to the booth to go say hi to him. Henrik wasn't there. Um, and, you know. I, I with Lou. That's yeah, how we met. <laughs> DK was just like, do you mind if I, like, stay nice. and wait for him? We're like, cool. And I was like, well. Lonely What's your boy. name? <laughs> what, what, what do you do? How is, that, is, is your? Are you enjoying your day? <laughs> well, did you see me last time, Lou? Because I came. Heinrich was the one who um, brought me into. It wasn't Nam. It was uh, AES when when. I, oh uh, yeah. I wasn't at the AES one, so I did Imsta. I did Nam for them. I've done uh, a couple of private events for them and everything. So I've been repping for them for a few years, nice. but I think I missed the one with you because. I remember I've seen some mutual friends like Ashby and Tizio. Uh, Greg Wells was there at the times that I've mm-hmm. been there. Like a lot of a lot of mutual cats, uh, nice. you know, have been there. But I think I've missed yours, unfortunately. But hopefully this year we get to see each other in person. Hey, so um, we're yep, gonna end the, we're gonna we're gonna end the stream now. Thank you so much for everybody that's been watching for for that's been listening. Um, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy.